So people ask me about how to prove the, uh, that the moduli spaces are smooth. Yes. And also, so surely uh, in, in yesterday's uh, talk, the, uh, the, the quotation about uh, Bill Messing's theorem was done too briefly, so that so the uh, assertion that it's an easy exercise after Bill Messing's thesis uh, doesn't seem to be that easy. So let me do the exercise. So I'll do it in the case of the abelian variety. So here is an abelian variety over a, uh, over a field. So in the notation we have, this is always a perfect field of characteristic P. Okay. And we'd like to show that this deformation, the deformation functor is smooth. So smoothness of the deformation functor. Zero over. W. Okay. So what, what's the key? So there, well, people also asked about representability. That's, so there, for representability, there are lots, there is uh, a set of sort of, sort of formal criteria that one needs to check, and that are lab tests. One can, you can just look at uh, the, uh, sort of the Schlesinger criteria written in many places, and most of these are easy. The one that's more serious is to show that it is smooth. So what does that mean? So, so suppose that uh, R0 is an Artinian uh, local WK algebra. And then we have an abelian scheme A over R, R0, such that A uh, tensors back R0 the spec of K is A0. Okay, so this is one, this we, so we have one deformation. Okay. Now, so to, to show smoothness, uh, it suffices to show the following situation. Suppose that R is an extension, it's a new potent extension, R, and we usually one assumes that it's, it's square zero, I'm going to assume a little more. Said so that uh, i times the maximum ideal of r is zero. That also suffices because you can say besides so these uh, new potent extension in such way. Okay. And I would like to show that. So I must show that we can lift uh, a over r zero to this new potent extension R. Okay. And that, that's one criterion of smoothness that we need to check. So now, what do we do? So by uh, Gotenic messing, so we know that we have this functor, that for me, uh, this functor which is D, uh, just write uh, A or A0. So let's say D or A0. Now what I'll do is, uh, we'll observe that this extension, because it's square zero, therefore it has a trivial DP structure, as we explained yesterday. So making all so a higher power, higher DP power to be zero. And we can evaluate that at R. So what do we get? So this is, so this is a uh, free R module of rank uh, 2G. G is always the dimension of A0 over K. Moreover, what else do we have? We know that, so D of A0, so this, if we evaluate it at R0, what that is is nothing but Tensoring over R with R0. So this is D A0 evaluated on R0. But now over R0, we, this is an abelian scheme. And therefore, it has a Hodge filtration. Because this, uh, this, we know that this is, this is the a first homology, the ramp homology of A0 over R0. So A over R0 in that notation. So, uh, it has a, uh, has a Hodge filtration 
And so this is A over R0, over 0. And this is a Lie algebra of the dual obedience scheme over R dual. So that's the hot filtration. Each one, this has, this is free, and then rank equals G. And this is also free of uh, rank G. And what? Oh, first in the kernel. Oh, yes, R0, I'm sorry. Thank you. So I wrote it wrong. Okay. So, uh, so this theorem, the growth and messing, what it says is that lifting this Hodge filtration to a direct summand over here is the same as, lift, uh, as lifting the, lifting the uh, obedient skin. Okay. So now smoothness follows from the fact that this, let's call it S0, S0 lifts to a direct sum. Namely, there is, exists some free uh, R submodule of that free module of rank 2G, which is a direct sum. Okay. Moreover, Moreover, so so it's it's a stand, it's an easy exercise in algebra that lifting exists. So lifting both has hot filtration, and we know that it's the same as lifting the obedience scheme. And lifting, moreover, if we consider the set of all liftings, now just by looking at that that diagram. We know that this is has a natural structure as a torsor. It's not; it doesn't have a natural group structure. But if we have two liftings, we can compare that. This is sort of standard thing, standard business about Grassmannian to torsor for what's the torsor? The torsor is the of a. R0 over R0, no deal anymore. Tensor over R0, Li of A over R0, tensor over R0. Uh, in fact, so this, yeah. And then R0 over. And this, because I is killed by that, so I can really replace it. K over A over A over K, and this is over K now. So, and this is a vector space of dimension vector space, and that's why the uh, tangent space of the deformation, so the de the dimension of the deformation function. I'm sorry, dear, I omitted the dual or No, I think it's the dual of the first tensor factor without the dual abelian variety. It's half of the quotient into each term. Right, it's, it's over there. I take a half into that. No, you take a half from the quotient into the kernel. It's classified in different ways. Half of the quotient? No, if we have two of these, then take their difference. It's that for anything in the sub, I look and I have two, two things above it, and then take, it, take the difference and project down. This looks like this. All right, so that's so that that's the exercise, and of course I did only I have done only one exercise. 
I also stated another exercise, which is that if you have a, a principal polarization, then the deformation functor is again smooth. The dimension of that is g times g plus one over two. And for that, you need not only so the, uh, the fact that I stated about lifting hot filtration, but you also need the behavior of the, uh, the, uh, the uh, domain crystals under, the, under duality, which is also stated in the notes. Okay, so that's that. I'll get that out of the way. Now, uh, what I would like to do today is largely utilitarian. Uh, in the sense, uh, in some, well, the, the first goal, uh, the two goals, one is that uh, this will be introducing or reintroducing some linear algebra tools which, were, which was mentioned uh, in Bill Messing's talk yesterday. It's one of the uh, Cartier, one of the Diodonet series that, that was one of the many Diodonet series that was mentioned in the last talk yesterday. And so in, although it's already in one sense where it's already uh, displayed, it's already was explained, one doesn't seem to need to have that explained again. But it's always use, uh, useful, at least uh, for students, I remember when I was a graduate student, to have things explained several times. And also, the other reason is that I would uh, need to sort of make things a little more explicit. And most of all, I would like to convince you that these things are doable. You can, you, this is something you can compute by hand and, and reducing it to linear algebra. And also that this, uh, donate, uh, this Cartier theory will be used serious, in a very serious way in Francis' talk, uh, I think next three talks. So before I do that, I, I'd like to do some examples. So I guess I'll, I'm trying to, to, to be a so-called user in the computer world. A user is supposed to be somebody who is not very intelligent, who only have looked at the manual and tried to figure out how things work. And this is the, the mentality I'll, I'll be in for the, uh, for the first, maybe the next 10 minutes. So the, so before I do the examples, so let me state what the, uh, the ring have, I have in mind. So this is the part that I'll be recalling before doing the examples. So this is a ring. This is a non-commutative ring. So remember that K is a perfect field of characteristic P, so as before. And now there is this critical ring which of which we will build up linear algebra, which will decipher for us uh, either Borsati Te group or formal groups. Okay. It's written this way, but it's really not, not quite right. So what this is, is that you have structural equations, so commutation relations, have where for every A in omega, in the bit vectors, you have F, and the elements of the bit vectors, so, and, so commutes, almost commute, commute up to sigma, where sigma is always the technical lift. Okay, so if you, if you like, it's, it's an automorphism of bit vectors, which induces uh, the Frobenius map on the residue field. If you realize this bit, standard bit vectors in, as vectors with infinite entries, it's raising every entry uh, to the power p. Okay. And now we have a v equals uh, v a sigma for a in every element. Okay. And then f v equals v f equals p. So these are the structural equations. Now, if you like, you can also think about it as, uh, as follows. You can think about it as elements in a formal power, in the finite sum, where i is, for so i is in z, z, it's a finite sum, such that each ai is in an element 
in the fraction field of the bit vectors. So that's a uh, local field in a general sense, such that the, for every i, the order of a i plus is bigger than or equal to the maximum of 0 and minus i. So all I'm doing is that I'm thinking about the, the, the way to, to decipher this is that v is f is p times v inverse. So that powers of v becomes power, negative powers, uh, powers of f becomes powers of v. Okay. So th this is just this ring. Okay, so it's, a, it's, a, it's an easy ring uh, in some sense. Now, so what we know is that so, uh, so we have the so black box, so I'll rephrase one of the black boxes, uh, which, for, sorry? Yes. AI is, now let me think. AI is, yes, yes. I, I could have done this, if you like, because or the powers of powers of v becomes p times some power, some negative power of v. Powers of f becomes some positive power of p times some negative power of, of v. So that's, you're absolutely right. It's all here. Okay. Now, so the black boxes is that sort of uh, modules, so left, RK modules, which are free, with a free uh, finite rank, over WK, is equivalent. So, if you like, I take this category, and there is a equivalence of, cat of categories between such things and uh, p divisible groups over k. So please, well, so we'll accept this as, as given. So k is a perfect field for of characteristic P. So now we're ready to do some examples. So, so well, we have some, some simple P divisible groups. Okay. Perhaps the simplest one is mu P infinity. So this is the uh, inductive, this is the limit of mu P to, mu P to the i's. This is a Brasati T group attached to the trivial torus. Okay. What does that correspond to? Well, it corresponds to this module, uh, the underlying vector space is nothing but the bit vectors. Okay. Now on the bit vectors, we, have, we, have, we all have seen that there is a sigma. Okay. So, and now, so what I want to say is that Think V and F, we need two operations. Now, so F is sigma, and while P is, uh, V is P sigma inverse. So, so here we go. So you have two operators. I'm just naming capital F to be sigma, and V is P times sigma inverse. And they obviously satisfy these, the commutation re relations required for being a module over R. So in other words, for, to, to get a, a uh, module required like this is that you have a free module, a finite rank over the bit vectors, and have two operators, F and V. Now F is semilinear in that way. And so sigma semilinear, and V is sigma inverse semilinear. 
So we have this, so that, that's one. So example one. Example two, now you may, add, you may wonder, what, it, what would the constant Barsati take would correspond under this situation? Well, but there is another one like this, which sort of, you know, here I have the P and F that way. But what would happen if I just make a shift of, of, of this P from the position here to the position, so one notch down? So v is sigma inverse, and F is P sigma. Still, that clearly satisfies the uh, commutation relations. And that is this. Now three, so let me, let me make a module which whose underlying, it, module structure is free of rank two over Okay, so I have two bases labeled as E1 and E2. Now, if I want to have F and V this way, it suffices to, to say what effect it has on E and on E1 and E2. That was specified. So I'll let F, I'll define F uh, and V. I'll two have defined two operators, and F sends E1 to E2, and then extend and then F sends E2 to P times E1, and then extend by semilinearity. That's one such. And V is similar, although they are not the same operator, but on the basis, they just look like, the, they look the same. So we will get another so this is clearly, so you can check that this is clearly satisfy all these properties. So it corresponds to sort of left modules over this. Oh, I should say also under this correspondence, the rank over WK corresponds to the height of the underlying Barsati table. Okay. So I'll be adding a little more so from time to time. So he, and so, so if you believe this, this will correspond to a high two Barsati take group. The question is, what is it? Well, maybe here, I'll I guess I'll ch follow the notation in, in the notes where a little k always denotes an algebraically closed field. That do that. So nothing really changed. And the answer, to, so if we want to identify this, you have all heard about super singular elliptic curves. So the M corresponds to, this M corresponds to a super singular elliptic curve. It's taking, so it's super singular. You take a super singular elliptic curve over a characteristic P. Now you take its attached P divisible group and it's, and the resulting sort of module is just this. Okay. Cool. Now next, I would like to uh, introduce a series of examples. And to do this systematically, I'll take two integers, m and n, such that your GCD is 1. m and n are both non zero. Okay. There are lots of such. And I'll define a p divisible group, m sub m a, so over k, let's say. So the k is an algebraically closed field of characteristic p. Okay. And I define it by saying that it's Barsati take, or this, uh, its Gildonet module has the following form. So I'll write it's RK divided by one equation. Okay. 
and, and let me look at this secretly, and I'm correct. Okay. So let me, now it's time to tell, tell you something more about so this correspondence. So under this correspondence, so on the one hand, if you have a Borsati T group, it has something called a dimension. And the dimension, if you have, so x, I guess that's notation, it's a Borsati T group over K, and it corresponds to a, a Dudonet module M. If that happens, we have already seen that the rank of M over the dead vector is exactly equal to the height of this Borsati T group. Right? Now, we also, there's another invariant, which is the dimension of x. If x is attached to a genuine group, a smooth group, you can, so if the, uh, so for instance, in the beat variety, then it's, that group itself has a dimension. The notion of the dimension will then coincide. And what does it correspond here? This corresponds to, you take m divided by vm. Now, since p is v times something, once you kill v, p becomes zero. So this becomes a vector space over k, and that we can talk about. It's finitely generated, and if m, this is the correspondence. I should also say, as mentioned in Bill Messing's uh, talk yesterday, that V corresponds to Fulvanius on X. <laughs> this is an unfortunate, so I've, I've hiding it so far. So for those of you who had some experience, there are uh, many versions of, uh, of Dudonet theory. And especially there are some covariant and some, there are some contravariant. So for those of you who have seen these, so so far I've been using the covariant theory. And in covariant theory, V corresponds to the, fo the geometric Fulvanius. Right? So it's, it, it doesn't, it's not that F corresponds to Fulvanius. It's different. It's exactly the opposite. Okay, now let's go back to here. So this is just a simple module defined by one equation. You, should, you can check that the underlying uh, WK module structure is free. What's the rank of it? Or height? You can, if you look at this equation, you can see that you, know, you have V, sort of higher powers of V or higher powers of F, they got killed away. And so you have, so powers of V and powers of F up until, so both up to uh, one less. And then you have, so you do, do a little bit of that, you convince yourself very easily that the height is nothing but m plus m. So I'll leave that to you as an exercise. Now, let's think about its dimension. What's its dimension? Well, the dimension is, you should kill all v. You mod out v by it, so, so, but once you kill both V and this equation, you have killed also F to the M. So you, then you can see that the dimension of this, you have killed out all F to the M, so you, so you get a, syst, uh, a set of bases corresponding to powers of F from zero to M minus one. So the dimension of this is, uh, is the dimension of over k of m modulo vm always, and in this case, it's just m. Okay. Now another thing we would like to understand is, so we would like to understand the, the asymptotic divisibility properties of powers of these operators f and v. Okay. So if you raise v, to, you iterate v many times, we would like to know how divisible that is by p. Now, if you look at this, look, if you look at this equation, so I, how did I know, how did I uh, know I, I got it right? Because I secretly did some little computation, right? So here's not a, 
sequence this. So you look at this equation. You I multiply that, both uh, multiply this equation by v to the m. Okay. So this is, so this has one generator e. This generator is killed by v to the m minus f. Now if I raise to the power p, so it's a, if I call this generator e, then I see that v to the m plus m times this generator, it has is nothing but p to the n e, right? Just, just, I'm just multiplying both sides by v to the n. So at, you can see very quickly from this that asymptotically, if you take a high power v, then so v behave in terms of divisibility, v almost look like p to the power n over n plus n. So in terms of divisibility, V is like rate multiplied by P to the, this fractional power. And this power is, and so you can check because this is a monogenic, then asymptotically, every, so if you, if you look at high power P, hit it on here, then it's divisible by almost that power divided, uh, that power multiplied by M over M plus M. So, so a definition, the so slope of this n is equal to m over p. The idea, of course, is that asymptotically, Frobenius is divisible by just p to the power m over m plus n. So that's that's a series of examples. And of course, you can see that there are special cases. If m and n are both equal to 1, what do we recover? We recover exactly example 3. Well, if one of the n and m is 0, well, the other must be 1 then. Then we recover examples 1 and 2. GCD is one. Well, it's it's not used, but if GCD is not one, there are this slight. This, this is a definition, just because of, because I want to use it later. And the later here is right here, so because now it's easier to, for me to state. So there's a theorem. The uh, name. Messing. Oh, the, 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 uh, Martin. Sorry. Uh, so what it says is that every Barsati table or every p divisible group is isogenous, so over an algebraically closed field, is isogenous to Some powers of GMN, so I. So it's a product of these. So in other words, if we don't care about the exact isomorphism classes, but only up to isogeny, then then every Barsati Tate group over algebraically closed field is isogenous to a finite number of products of the examples that we just did before. Okay. Moreover, these multiplicities are unique. So E, I should say, E, I label it with E sub M N, and that's uniquely defined. So this is the, uh, this is the zero. And now we can define what, uh, complete what uh, Franz did yesterday. So we can define the Newton polygon. So this is one of, sorry? GCD, the GCD condition, yes. I mean, the other, the otherwise, I mean, if I wa don't want them to be, there are problems. But, so here is MN, 
So this is summing over all power, uh, all pairs, satisfying the above condition. So no, now it's the definition of Newton polygon for X. So what do we do? We saw that combinatorially to define the Newton polygon, it suffices to define a sequence of slopes with multiplicity, right? And so, so what's the sequence and what's the multiplicity? If X is like this, it's that we have M over M plus N, and then has multiplicity The multiplicity is e times m, this multiplicity of this, how many times? But each time it appears, we want to repeat the, uh, the slope as many times as its height. And that de defines the Newton polygon. And also I should warn you, if you or if you have sort of begin to get into sort of reading these materials, there are in the, so in the literature, so there are slopes defined by using V and F. So here I'm sort of using the slope defined by V because that corresponds to Frobenius. But if you use F instead, then it becomes not using M over M plus N, but rather N over M plus N. So one always have to, to be careful. But for abelian varieties, you have no such problem because for abelian varieties, there is a duality statement and therefore you cannot, because you can always choose a polarization. And therefore abelian varieties, whenever you have one appearing, the other must appear. So if slope lambda appears, the slope one minus lambda must appear and they have the same multiplicity. So, and the Newton polygon, polygon is symmetric and you just don't get confused. But if you have to think about a non-symmetric situation, be careful of what was being sort of said. Okay, so I guess uh, I've spent a lot of time just playing with the uh, linear algebra. Now, the next thing is I would like to show you, so well, I don't think I have enough time to do all the story. But, uh, and also the story in itself has been uh, presented in yesterday's talk. So. I'll try to So in some sense, I'll be, uh, oh, before that, I think there's a good exercise here. So it's an exercise is to show that the set of all Newton polygons or the set of symmetric Newton polygons Franz uh, explained yesterday that there is a partial ordering on the set of Newton polygons and also on the, therefore also on the set of symmetric Newton polygons. Okay. Now, so if you forget about everything else that being coming from p-divisible groups, but just remember the combinatorial structure that it's a partially ordered set. So we have these sort of partially ordered set. Now one thing, uh, one property about partially ordered set is that sometimes these partial orders, orderings can be very wild. But these, the exercise, is that they are ranked. Ranked partially ordered set. Ranked meaning that in a partially ordered set, if you take two of them, suppose they are comparable. So there's a chain from one to the other. And then you can think about maximal chains now, the rank B means that if you fix two endpoints, then any two maximal chains have the same length. Okay. So uh, this, this is an amusing exercise. So anyone can do. You don't need to know anything about, uh, about uh, formal groups and anything. And this, in fact, has some geometric implications in uh, things that Franz, uh, I think, probably will mention. Okay, now. So I'll, I'll tell the story, but 
uh, about Cartier, about the uh, Cartier theory. So this is one of this is one of the possible Diodonate theory. So among other things, so the features is that it's covariant that I've said. But one thing that's really important, and this is one of the few situations that I know of in algebraic geometry, is that you can use these to construct uh, non-infinitesimal deformations. Real deformations, so, so, so can be used to construct deformations over rings like the K double bracket T. So this is a standard thing. In usual, stand, in usual deformation theory, each time you have to worry about obstruction, and even if you know it's smooth, I mean, you don't know how to write down a family. But this is one of the rare situations that I, I know I can't think about many other situations that can just really write down a family over a formal curve, the spectrum of a formal curve. So it really goes up. And this feature will be used in Francis' talk. So what, what is Cartier's theory? Cartier's theory has the advantage of being completely elementary. So, uh, in, in the following sense, that if you work with, work with it for, I'll say, be conservative, for invest, you invest a week doing nothing but playing with the linear algebra and that you will get a pretty good hand of it. You do, there, there's not, not much theory going on other than familiarity. And familiarity brings so Bruce content. So, okay, so what's the theory? So there is a key observation. But this is an underlying phenomenon for everything that follows, is that there is a formal group it's an infinite dimensional formal group of which, of which you can build every formal group, commutative smooth formal group out of it. So in some sense, it's that if you think about the category of all smooth formal groups, it in some, some sense, it looks like it has a free generator in the sense of uh, abelian scheme, uh, sorry, abelian categories. Although, of course, we know that so the category of formal, uh, commutative for smooth formal group is not abelian. But this thing that I'm going to describe makes it look rather s seem like a free generator. And th so, so I'll use the notation lambda. And I guess I'll, since I've, the, note, the way the note is written, uh, back a uh, so there is an ex exception. For a while, although so far I've been trying to be consistent, whenever I write a little k, it's an algebraically closed field of characteristic p. Now, temporarily for today only, k is an arbitrary ring, commutative ring with identity. Now, so it goes to the set of the category of all abelian groups. So what is it? If, if you take a Neopotent algebra, it, it gives you uh, the set of all elements of the form ai t to the i, where, so this is a finite sum. This is an important point. And t is a formal variable. And this AI are in there. Okay. What's this? This you think of as a subgroup of, uh, let me write, K direct sum with N. So that's a commutative ring with, identi with identity. And then a joint T. It's a polynomial ring. Generally, a polynomial ring. In 
or you may think it doesn't have a lot of units, but in this case, because you have lots of new potents, it does. So in other words, where we are using the GM, the standard, the attribute torus, and use that, and we look, and then sort of spread it out by adding a, a formal variable to get an infinite dimensional formal group. And this is smooth, as you can check easily. And what is it? this is, th is that this is a restricted version of the universal vid vector ring of, uh, or the group of universal vid vectors. So this is that. Now, what, I have 10 minutes or so, so I'll try to be quick. Now, so one can choose, one can, so having this, now if you have a group, have a smooth formal group as defined yesterday uh, in Bill Masson's talk, that is, it's a, it's a functor from here to here, which is exact and smooth. Okay. And now, so there's a UNIDA type theorem which says the following, if you look at homomorphisms from lambda to a given group, so if you have such a homomorphism. But on the other hand, so you have this homomorphism. Now, in here, you can, you have, so to speak, a universal element by evaluating it, by evaluating n, so n, n, this is here, the function is given, but we evaluate n as, so to speak, uh, k times k double bracket x. So th this, so I mean, n here, also is, although it's new potent, you can pass to inverse, inverse limit, so you can also feed in topologically new potent algebras. Okay. Now this is obviously a topolo topologically new potent algebra. So if I feed that into it, so I have a homomorphism of lambda evaluated at this nilpotent ring, topologically nilpotent ring, and I have something here. So I evaluate, and here, this is a special element in lambda of this topologically nilpotent ring. That's a special element, and therefore, being, having a homomorphism, it gives an element here, right? And this you can think of as having formal curves. This is formal curves by definition. In G, where X is the variable for the formal curve. Okay. So we have this, and the statement is that this is an equivalence. This is a bijective. So when we talk about formal curves, it's nothing but, so you can think about formal, a formal curve as a homomorphism. Okay. Now having that, it, then it's very good. So if you believe in this business, that lambda is a formal generator, then the standard formalism of for a beating category is that if you know some element, you just have to, to get an element, it's equivalent to knowing hum of this free generator into that given element. This is your abstract form of the Morita equivalence. So if you believe in all these, uh, then what we get is, you can look at the notes for specific statement, but it roughly says that so the modules over, now I would like to say endomorphism. If you look at this, this look, it looks like a module over the endomorphism ring of lambda, except that it will be a right module. So it's, and it's a convention that started a long time ago. Nobody is going to change that. So we will be using left modules. To use left modules, therefore, we will not use the endomorphism algebra, but rather, it's the opposite algebra over that. 
So that's what we think, that, think about. So this as just not forgetting about that's a, that's a group. Uh, it's a hum of lambda to this group, but rather thinking about it as a left module over this. Okay. There are, okay. That's again, a plus some um, filtration. This, the filtration, uh, it's written in the notes. You can read. So there are, there are certain mild conditions that this such thing uh, needs to be satisfied. And then the theorem says that if you have any module, that module, over this ring, then uh, satisfying those mild conditions that I stated, then you get a uh, smooth formal group. It's an equivalence of categories. And moreover, it's also written in the notes, uh, that you can recover the group from this module. If you believe in this, it's almost, you can almost do it. If you have a module N, it's a left module, so this will be called the Cartier ring over K. It's a, it's a big ring. And to recover that, The endomorphism, the, module, the group itself, is a left module over, over its endomorphism algebra tot tautologically. And therefore, it's a right module over the opposite ring. Uh, now, you, it almost like you take the tensor product, you recover it. And in general, you have to do a reduced tensor product because there, are certain, there may be certain junk relation that you have to kill because of the topological relations. And that's that. This is very simple. And I guess the key really is that, so in, all, in some sense, this is not, it's not a surprise. You have something almost like an abelian category. There's a general theorem that if you have an abelian category, you can decipher with satisfying some mild conditions, such as for having some free generators. You can decipher that as so a subcategory of modules over some rings. So the serious business is to understand this ring. If M is that group, so so, so I'm, in some sense I'm giving the uh, the reverse. So there's an equivalence of category. So one is taking a group and you make that construction, and the other is taking some sort of tensor product. Okay. Now the key is the key of this is to understand the ring structure of this. So they're, they're, the ring structure is written down in the notes. I'm not going to repeat it. So just copying it uh, will take a lot of time. And I didn't prepare my slides. And in this situation, I happen not to think the slides wouldn't help very much. Uh, the key is to play with them. So I strongly advise anybody so who wants to get your hands on to play with it. I, if I have time, I'll do a, one more example uh, after that. I need some time to go a little bit further because this ring is too big in general. And this is not what people usually use for precisely because this ring is a little too big. Uh, okay. So the point is that, so suppose that the base ring, K, okay, is a Z localized at P algebra, meaning that every prime other than P is invertible. So suppose that's the case, then the theory simplifies in the sense that this ring gets a lot smaller. Okay. Now, so what's, what's the point? The point is that uh, there, one can write down very explicitly, but in order to, for any formula to make sense, you really need to get used to so the, so these uh, relations in the ring. So it's written in the notes. Okay. So you have an idempotent in this ring. Now, then what happens is that 
you can use this Eden potent. You can use this Eden potent to cut down a much smaller ring. And similarly, if you have a Cartier module, so I, I write this as MP, M of G. If you have a Cartier module, M of G, then I define a much smaller one by taking the Cartier module of G over the big ring and then just multiply it by epsilon. Okay. So, so this, so it's obvious that this MP of G is a module over the uh, Cartier P ring. Right? And the fact is, maybe, um, maybe it's sort of surprising when you first see it, but uh, after a while, it's not a surprise anymore that you lose no information whatsoever. So in this situation, we have, so again, commutative smooth formal groups uh, corresponds to left modules over the Cartier P rings plus some mild condition, topological condition. Again, the condition is written in the notes. Now I think I have maybe five minutes left. First, I would like to explain the relation between this ring and RK that we introduced at the beginning. What's the relation? They're not the same. So you, you can read the notes and see. So there, the, again, the point is that there, so you can, you, there is a precise, a very precise description of elements of this ring by generators and relations. We, we know what the elements are. We know how to manipulate them. But in, so uh, I revert to the, the situation we have. So what we have, our K here, is that this is a completion of that. So a completion. And you may ask, what is, so how do you do the completion? And here is an answer. If you remember this notion of summation AIVI, uh, Z satisfying that order of AI uh, plus Oh, sorry, bigger than or equal to the maximum of zero and negative i. You have this, and then, so you want to complete such things, and we'll complete it with respect to certain topology. And the way that the topology goes can be described uh, as follows. It's the same as requiring that the order of AI, so this is the order, P normalized p adequately plus AI goes to infinity. So it, it, it's nothing but this. So what's the result? The result is that this being a bigger ring, it has less modules in some sense. Because to have, to be a, for a module over RK to be a module over this completed ring, it's that certain limit condition should satisfy. Certain limit should go to zero. Okay. If it happens, it becomes, you pass by, pass to completion, you get a module over this Cartier ring. Okay. But it's not satisfied, you don't. Okay. For instance, you can look, uh, see some examples. For instance, this constant group. As I goes to infinity, the absolute value of I goes to infinity. Uh, this is elementary. So, so we have that. Finally, uh, I think I have about one or two minutes left. Finally, uh, 
can't find the sponge for some reason. Oh, I'm blind. Yes. If I would write W double bracket G and then single bracket F, is that exactly the same? Yes. It's, it's, it, well, I, th I think it depends. I, uh, so, so this Cartier ring, so an, another description is really the standard, so, uh, so V to the M, let's say A, M, N, V, uh, and for every, so A sub M, N, in K, for every M, N, and then for every M, there exists a constant such that uh, a sub m n equals zero for all m bigger than or equal to c sub n. That that's that. I mean that's certainly the risk. Like the first yeah. two is a single bracket. Yeah, I'm not sure. So thick double and sub single bracket. But, but this ring, if you decipher it, uh, it becomes the uh, ring of convergent power series that, that unfortunately seems to have erased. The, yeah, the bit vector is that you have A, the bit vector is A, and then embeds go to uh, A equals A0, A1, and so on. And that gives uh, V I, A sub I, F to the power I. So I figured that makes sense. And that's an embedding of the ring of bit vectors, periodic bit vectors, into here. So the, the note, meaning of these is written in the notes. So, but, but I would like to mention one thing, if I can just take a uh, few, uh, maybe two minutes more. R let me write down something. So the point that's what I was trying to make, which will be used in Francis', in Francis lecture, is that using the Cartier theory has the advantage that you can write down really families, not only just over an Artinian rings, but over so quite non-Artinian rings. So here I'll write down one such family. Okay. So I take the Cartier ring, but I use a base ring, or K, let's say K is an algebraically closed field. Now I'm reverting to the previous uh, notation, characteristic P. I have a formal power series ring and number of variables, and now I divide out by one relation. And what's that relation? I take x0 plus x1 times v, and similarly to x sub h, I'm sorry, this is h minus 1, this is correct, v to the power. Uh, Oh, so I'm sorry, not zero. This is one. This is what I meant. H minus one plus V to the H minus F. That's the relation. Okay? What this is, is that this is, so if you think, if I reduce modulo the maximum ideal here, namely I kill off all the Xi's, then I get one relation. Namely, v to the, oh, I'm sorry, this is minus two. Okay. v to the h minus one equals v. What that is, if you remember, so this is one of the examples we had. This is a one dimensional formal group of height h. Okay. And what, oh, this I can, in fact, uh, oh yes, this is correct. So if you like, uh, you, I, well, I can use this. One can, in fact, also use the bit vectors, if you like. That's, 
because the bit vectors, all, this is also uh, with, with sort of a, a ZP, a Z parenthesis P algebra. Okay. So we have this. What this is, is that we have written, this happens to be a very, very explicit form of the universal deformation space of that one dimensional formal group of height H, or one dimensional Borsat detail group of height H. And this is not for idle, so it's not something that we just invented. This actually happens as the, uh, as the formal completion at a point of certain moduli variety. Okay. And so I was, so this is something very explicit you can construct. In some sense, we seem to understand it. On the other hand, if you remember, being a deformation space, we have the automorphism group of G1 H minus 1 operating on it. So my either both assertion and exercise is that the assertion is that this is an interesting action, and that this is something it's possible to compute by hand. And it's Interesting, I think. And so if for people who want to sort of really understand so how things work, this is a good starting place to, to play. <laughs>